Hey guys, and welcome into this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. A little bit late this week, but we are getting our podcast in right now. A little bit of late night heels talk as I welcome in Zach Hubbard. How's your week been, man? It's been good. It's been good. I'm excited for the game this weekend, ready to have Carolina basketball back, and uh, really just excited for this season to kind of um, get a new start here this weekend. Yeah, yeah, I feel you. So, uh, you going to the game this weekend, or uh, no, you're not going to be able to make it up there? I'm not going to be able to make it to this game. Hopefully, I'm going to get down there in a couple weeks, try to get down there maybe for uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, If any of our listeners are going to that one, I'll I'll probably be at that one. So, try to usually get in a couple games a year um, now that I'm no longer on campus. Right, yeah, no, I feel you, man. I'm going to be in the same boat. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make it to this weekend's game. Um, because of my internship responsibilities, but yeah, that 13th, I think that's what I'm, I'm, uh, that's one of the games I'm going to try to hit. I think it's going to be that one in NC state. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty psyched. Yeah. I think, uh, this weekend though, you know, the fans that are going to be there, I hope they're going to be loud. They're going to be ready to go, you know, first time in, um, you know, almost kind of what feels like a new stadium with the seatbacks being in there. It kind of has that feel of, you know, there's just something new. There's a little bit of life in the stadium. I think that, you know, having last week off may have actually helped this fan base as a whole to kind of recollect themselves. And I think they're going to come in passionate for this week uh, and, and ready to go against a team in Pittsburgh that, you know, we've had a pretty good amount of success against, especially in the Larry Fedora era. Um, To this time, you know, Larry has not lost to them since they entered the ACC. The Heels haven't lost to them. So, you know, when you go into this week, are you feeling pretty confident that this team can come out on Saturday and pull out their first victory of the year? Well, just based on the fact that Fedora has never lost to Pitt in his career, you have to feel at least somewhat confident just based off that history. You know, uh, even though the games have often been victory so you have to assume that you know uh, Larry Fedora and his staff have been in this position before they've faced these pit teams they kind of know what to expect from a Pat Narduzzi team Um, solid running game ball control um, grinding out the clock so they kind of understand I guess the general game plan and this this pit team is a lot like other pit teams we've seen in the past in terms of its build and makeup and uh, the, the style of play they want to run. So I, I don't think there's anything new here for the staff to see. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And when I look at this pit team, I mean, clearly their strength is going to be running the football with Quadre Olison. Um, you know, to this point, Kenny Pickett really hasn't looked all that great. So, yeah, I, I kind of agree. I think this is very, very similar to what we've seen from a lot of pit teams before. And even when they've had their most successful quarterbacks, you know, the one that come, that kind of sticks out to me and seems to be the most successful would be Nathan Peterman and his time on campus. You know, we found a way to pull that out. But, you know, it seems like whenever we play them, there is some offense that needs to be had. And, you know, at this point with where the Tar Heel offense is, I'm kind of wondering, you know, are you a little bit concerned as to whether or not the Heels will potentially be able to keep up, especially with the fact that most of the times that we've had success against Pitt, it's been because of the passing game. Absolutely. And I think the passing game is going to be paramount to this game as well. If you look at Pitt's defense, their strength is in their front seven, not as much in their secondary, so they're going to be more vulnerable to the pass than they would be to the run, making that all the more important. And so far in 2018, Carolina's passing game has struggled, as we've mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Um, And that really comes down to a lot of different factors. That comes down to quarterback play, of course, but that comes down to pass blocking, and that comes down to receivers getting open. So all those things are going to need to work together um, to have a chance, really, to be effective in this passing game because Pitt does a pretty good job so far, at least in 2018 of, of stopping their opponents on the ground um, outside of Georgia tech, of course, as they play in an option offense that's, that's going to get yards on the ground regardless. Um, in right. terms of passing the ball, like we mentioned last week, we kind of talked about that, uh, that quarterback question of, is it going to be um, Nathan Elliott? Or how much time will Cade Fortin get? And it, you know, last week I said that I thought that I wanted Nathan Elliott to start. Um, I've changed my stance to a degree. I, I, I've now come around to the idea of Cade Fortin looking, 
looking back at the very little that we saw against ECU, you can see his arm talent. You can see his ability to move the ball downfield, even if not all of those passes were, you know, on, on target. Of course, they were playing kind of once the game had been decided. But I really like what I see from him. I think he might possibly have the best, you know, pure passing ability on this team as of right now. Um, and I, I certainly think that, that could give the Kellen offense a spark. It sounds like Nathan Elliott is going to get the start, but in my opinion and my hope is that he has a little bit of a shorter leash than we saw in the first two games, kind of uh, if things are, aren't working, if, if mistakes are made, whether it be a drive stalling or even similar to the Cal game where there's another turnover. Uh, I, I, I hope that the Carolina staff is not afraid to kind of throw Kate out there and let him make plays and even let him make some mistakes so he can, grow and learn um not only for for this season and for this game but for the future as well uh to see him grow into you know a good quarterback down the line quickly turning back to what you said and i thought that was a great point you know you bought up brought up the fact that their passing defense is still a bit of a question and i want to reiterate that to people yeah they're only allowing 167.5 yards passing but you look at the teams that they faced. They faced an Albany team that is an FCS team. They faced Penn State when it was pretty much downpouring rain for most of the game. And late in that game, they got destroyed. And then, you know, you look at the Georgia Tech game. They don't really pass the ball that much, as most people know, because of the triple option. So at the same time, I believe that both stats are a little bit flawed in each direction. I think that their run defense is a lot is better than what's being shown, and I think that their pass defense is a little bit worse than what's being shown. And you know, you talked about it with Cade Fortin. I just put the article out earlier today saying, you know, I, with my position on it, which was to go with Cade Fortin. And you know, I think there really isn't a much better game to go with him here. You've had some time off. You've had some time for him to potentially get prepared a little bit for this game, coming off a game in which he did play in in East Carolina. And, you know, you look at Pittsburgh, and so far, you know, historically under Pat Narduzzi, their secondary has really, really struggled, especially against the Tar Heels. So, to me, I, I don't think there's really a better game on the schedule that you could potentially throw in a true freshman like Cade Fortin and see what he's got, you know. And I'm thinking at this point, you know, even if he does struggle, if he does struggle that bad, don't wait until it gets awful. Don't wait until he throws three or four interceptions. You know, if it does get that bad, go back to Nathan Elliott and just say, okay, well, at least we know what we've got in Cade. At least we know that there is some potential there, but there are some things that we need to work on with him for in-game situations. And, you know, I, I agree with you. I think right now he has the best arm talent on the team. And frankly, I don't think it's really all that close because, you know, we've seen what we can get out of Nathan Elliott. He's a guy that can really complete those underneath routes, but at times, he's even missing those, and the deep routes, it, it just hasn't been there. He doesn't have the arm strength, and the main thing for me that's been frustrating with Elliott so far this season has been the footwork. Then there's Chaz Surratt, which, you know, a lot of people think, look, Chaz Surratt is the solution. I think that he may be able to come in and have some sort of impact early, but the thing is, is we as we saw last year, when time wore on, when teams started to figure out what Chaz Surratt did well, when they were able to start to get more pressure on Chaz Surratt, he really panicked, dropped his eyes a lot earlier than he did early in the season, wasn't able to work through his progressions as well as you would like. And now he is going to have an off season to grow and he has had an off season to grow. But at the same time, you know, I kind of just wonder if you actually throw him in a game how effective is he really going to be right off the bat, especially with the fact that he has been basically playing second fiddle, playing behind, um, you know, I think even Cade Fortin in some practices because they have to have Fortin ready in case there is an injury here in these first what was supposed to be four games, now three. I, I kind of wonder if he would really be able to come in and take over like that. And then when you look at Jace Reuter, look, I like Jace Reuter a lot. 
problem with Jace Reuter is, again, when you look at his college, or, or excuse me, high school statistics, he wasn't really a big-time passer because that's not the style of offense that they ran out at Norton High School in Kansas. They, they were a run-based offense. So there's not a lot to go off of there. He could have a really good arm. We just really don't know. But from what everything that we're hearing, and I know that you're hearing as well, is that right now, Cade Fortin has the best arm. And like Larry said, and I think this is what really hurts him in this situation and is going to you know, be what a lot of people use as reference to say, hey, let's start him, is when he came out and said, look, this kid can make all the throws. Well, if he can make all the throws, he needs to be out there. We need a guy like that that can make the throws that Bren Renner could make, that at times, Keys could make, that Mitch could make. You know, those are the types of quarterbacks that can help drive this offense, which has seemed to really thrive, especially under Fedora, with great quarterback play. So, um, you know, I think why not? Throw him out there, see what he's got. Uh, if it's really that bad at the end of the first quarter or even before that, if it's, I mean, if he has three or four drives that are three and outs with no progress, then you can always go back to Nathan Elliott. But, you know, I, I don't see the harm in, in giving him a chance. So, yeah, I agree with you on that term. Um, You know, I, I saw the comments that Antonio Williams made, and I think right now, you know, there's not really a better leader on this team. This guy is motivated. He says that, you know, it has been a solid start to the season for him, but to this point, he, he expected to be a little bit better, and he's going to step his game up. You know, when you look at those comments from Antonio Williams, I mean, you know, that, that's that got to be a good thing for in your eyes as well, right? To see a leader that's kind of emerging, especially being a guy that is a transfer from Ohio State. Absolutely. Uh, any sort of leadership right now is really a, a welcome sign for this UNC team that's had, a, you know, a rough start to the season. And with all the sort of the side chatter and the talks of uh, – Larry Fedora's job status and talk of Fedora losing the locker room, it, it's good to see that that may not be the case. I mean, you look at another example this past week uh, in the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Florence that we have here in the Carolinas and in Virginia and a little bit in Georgia, um, the whole Carolina team donated money to, to, to send supplies out to people affected by that right. hurricane. Those are real things that, you know, the football team is doing in the North Carolina community as a team, as brothers bonded to a common purpose. So I, I don't think that this team has really given up on this season yet. I had hoped not, and I feel more confident about that now, that this is a team that is ready to go out. And like we've discussed uh, on last week's show, this is a team that is really starting from, from a clean slate that wants mm -hmm. to go out and play essentially what's now a nine-game season, wants to go 9-0 and as opposed to – nine and two everything's sort of fresh now um and i i think that's the mindset for both uh the players and the staff i think that's how they're looking at this um you generally want to take games one game at a time but i i think that's even more true in this scenario than it would be you know say at the first game or even the second game yeah, no, you're right, and that's got to be the mindset at this point is go out, find a way to win whatever game is in front of you, and that's, you know, a good thing. It kind of works out, you know, a little bit for this team. I'm not saying that it's a good thing that the Hurricane, of course, came through. That's n never anything that you want to see, but, you know, having an extra bye week, having a little bit of time to, you know, kind of regroup, recollect yourselves as a team – sort of block out what the media is saying and allow some of the hype around, you know, the the idea of moving on from Fedora to kind of dial it down a little bit. I think that's really helped these guys. And, you know, I, I think that's what they've got to focus on is on the field. You know, don't worry about these fans that are saying, oh, well, it's time for Fedora to go. Whether or not that's the truth or not, whether, you know, you believe it or not, the, these guys that are on the field, they cannot believe that. They've got to focus on what's ahead of them. It's a totally new season, like you said. I, that That's kind of the feel that's given off. And, you know, there are some winnable games, I, I think, ahead of them. At this point, 
look, the goal is to get to six wins. I think that's kind of where everybody's at. You know, before the season, I think that especially as we got closer and closer to the year, a lot of people were starting to get into that eight, you know, seven or eight win area saying that's kind of where this team could possibly be at because of everything that we had heard, because of the steps that the offensive line had taken. Well, right now, you know, that that just hasn't been the case out of the gate. So getting to a bowl game, I think, is just where everybody's at. And, you know, look, I think if they can get off to a good start and get the win against Pittsburgh, be 1-0 in conference, there's a real chance. And apparently now they're thinking about trying to get a 12th game on that schedule to help their chances of making a bowl game. You know, that that could be huge. So getting some momentum, I think, is the key out of the gate. But, yeah, um, you know, when I look at the defense, I think one of the keys to this game has to be to get pressure on the quarterback whenever they are put in those passing situations. I, I, I mean, we saw it last week. There really wasn't a whole lot of pressure on the quarterback, or excuse me, two weeks ago against ECU now. Um, there, there really wasn't a whole lot of pressure on the quarterback. I thought some guys had had better days than it probably showed. Um, I, I know a lot of people, when they look at defensive line play, want to say the only thing that really matters is what goes on sack-wise or tackles for loss. I, I thought overall Alan Cater looked pretty good for his first time out there. I thought Chris Collins and Jake Lawler both had some moments. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's going to be one of the keys against Kenny Pickett, especially considering that so far this season, a you know, two to three touchdown interception ratio. And really, I mean, he's, he's struggled back there. You know, when you look at the defensive line, I mean, who's the guy that you think has to step up for this unit and really take over in this game uh, against Pittsburgh? Well, you look at mainly not only who you have, but who you most likely will not have. And it seems like uh, Aaron Crawford and also uh, – Let's see, is it um, Malik. Malik Carney also will not be yes. in this game. He so will those be are two, mm -hmm. those yeah. are your two uh, best defensemen that you're going to have out yet again. So I, as with last week and the week before, you're going to have to make do with the defensive linemen you have. And it's something that we discussed somewhat uh, in, the, in the preseason is that this defensive line is one of the deepest positions on the roster right now, full of experience full of upperclassmen, and those guys have to step up. Um, not that they have not performed well. I, I certainly think that they performed well um, against Cal and a little bit less so against ECU, but they certainly haven't been a bad unit. But it, this is a defensive line that, like you said, has to get pressure in the quarterback and not necessarily get the, the tackle for loss or the sack. I don't think that those are necessary. Really, what all you have to do is disrupt the play, uh, make the quarterback nervous, make the quarterback run out of the pocket if you can. But you basically, make the play as as little successful as possible, however you can. If that's a sack or a tackle for loss, that's great. Uh, if not, all you have to do is you know get in the quarterback's face, put your hands up, and uh, be ready to affect the play, and make it hard for him. And when you look at uh, Kenny Pickett's style of play, because they want to run the ball so much, I would dare say that Kenny Pickett is more of a, a game manager, more wants to get those, those right. short throws. I mean, he's he's averaging 65 uh, 65%, which is really good, but he's only passing it about 21 times per game. His yards per game is about 135, so fairly low numbers with such a high accuracy usually tells us that he's throwing short, right. sort of easy passes to, easy passes and taking what the defense gives him. So I think that's going to be a key to this game, not only giving, uh, getting pressure from that front seven, which we're going to see, uh, you know, multiple looks there sort of as we have the new moving front, but also it's going to be on the secondary to kind of not give him those short underneath routes to make Kenny Pickett beat you with his arm down the field. Right, and I mean, with that, it, it's going to be really, you know, if you're going to go man-to-man, -man, you've got to be right there and ready to go. Don't let anybody inside of you make it tough for these receivers to get those inside breaks. And then if it's going to be zone, you've got to get to your zone quickly. 
Um, you know, when I look at the defensive line, I, I like what you said. You've got to make him uncomfortable. And whether that's making him roll, you're, you're basically what you're trying to do is make him off balance, make him throw these, the, you know, some of these passes off his back foot, make him have to make plays on the roll. Make, I, I mean, that's kind of what you're looking for. Make him have to make these throws down the field while he's on the run. And, you know, I mean, that's something that they really just have not been able to do. They didn't do it against ECU. I thought Reed Herring had a lot of time to throw in that game. And, you know, one of the guys that I think has to step up is Timon Fox. You know, we've heard so much about him. And really, you know, at times, Timon Fox has shown us that he can be that NFL caliber pass rusher. He can use his physicality to get to the quarterback. But really, we just haven't really seen him step up in a situation where he's been starting or where they've really been counting on him. And so far in the first two games of this season, he does not have a sack and really hasn't been able to get much pressure on the quarterback. So that's the one guy that I would really like to see step up. You know, some of these other guys, I think Alan Cater has a chance to take another step forward this week. I'd like to see Jake Lawler and Chris Collins maybe have a little bit of a bigger effect. I know they're young, but especially Chris Collins, he has that build and, and that speed rush mentality that you're going to get from Malik Corny. And I think that's something that this defensive line needs because I, I they just haven't really been all that successful when they've had two speed rushers. You know, we saw it a few years back when they had Norkeith Sotis and Mikey Bart, and it really just wasn't all that successful because they were both very similar. There was nobody that could get the pressure off the edge simply by beating the tackle outside. And with Malik Carney, I think that's the thing that's most frustrating to Tar Heel fans right now is that, look, you know, Malik Carney had never really been awful or never really bad, but he never played. That was easily the best game of Malik Carney's career against Cal. And then, of course, the you know after having his most successful game of his career, that's when his suspension starts. So it's a little bit frustrating at this point. You know, you're hoping that somebody can step up, but you know, I, I, right now, I think maybe as a whole unit, this defensive line has to just step up and be able to get in that backfield, make Kenny Pickett, as you said, uncomfortable. See if you can't get him on the back foot throwing some of these passes. And I mean, can we create a turnover? I mean, we have not seen any in the first two games of the year, and it seems like this has been one of the frustrating problems for a while with this team because. There's just I don't know how they're not there because there has been good coverage. These guys, I think, are really focused on pass deflections more than they're focused on turning the ball over. And that's fine. If you're playing great defense, that's fine. But I think it's just one of those things where Tar Heel fans know when our defenses were most successful, we were turning the football over. So I'd like to see that force Pickett to throw some of those interceptions, one or two. I mean, you're not expecting a you know four or five interception day of course but uh, you know these corners I think to this point have been covering well enough to where if you are able to get some of that pressure you will make you you will force under throws you will force throws that are you know in the middle of the defense that can be intercepted you know rush decisions can lead to turnovers and that could really really help this entire team, especially with an offense struggling, getting them better field position or potentially even intercepting a pass and returning it to the house for a touchdown, that could help boost the offense. Or who knows? I mean, if you play that good a defense, that could be the difference in the game. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, when you think about this game, what are some of your other keys to pulling out a victory at home against Pittsburgh? Well, my number one, uh, sort of key to this game is going to be stopping the run game of Pitt. That's going to be the number one thing. That's mm -hmm. how the whole game is going to go for Pitt, in my opinion. It's going to be based on how guys like Quadri Allison and, and even Kenny Pickett uh, running the ball mm -hmm. can get. Uh, most people don't know he's a dual threat, but he's uh, second in carries on the Pitt team. So getting, uh, of course, with the defensive ends, as you mentioned, but I think on the defensive line, it's uh, it's on these defensive tackles to step right. up and you know be a force not only in, in the pass rush but also in, in run stuffing and making these gaps smaller. Uh, and then you move to that linebacker core. Uh, 
in the first game they played very well, but it was mainly in pass coverage that we saw them play very well, specifically with Dominique Ross. And then you go to ECU, and there were significant issues with the linebacking core, uh, you know, stopping the run. There, there were gap integrity issues. There were missed tackles. There was, there was mistakes all over that linebacking core and stopping the run against ECU. So that, that has to be fixed this week to have a chance against Pitt. Um, another issue, or another sort of key, like I mentioned, uh, getting Kenny Pickett, um, I guess, behind schedule is the word that you'd want to use. Based on how their offense runs, if you can get them into you know second and long, third and long situations. Mm-hmm you're sort of dictating how their offense is going to go. The momentum's on your side, so I think that's another key. Uh, and then, as we mentioned previously, just getting this offense going at all for UNC. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've seen success in the running game to an extent, but it hasn't been consistent, and we really haven't seen any sort of pass offense consistently have success in the first two games. So really just finding a rhythm, whether that be with Nathan Elliott, if he's ready to go, or with uh, with Cade Fort, um, if if he's the one chosen to go out there and lead this offense, really just getting anything going is going to be, in my opinion, a key to this game. Yeah, no, I like what you said about stopping their run game. That's going to be a key, and I think the biggest thing against ECU that I saw was mainly the linebacking core, but a little bit the secondary, especially when they would come up and run help. It is just the missed assignments. There are gaps that are left wide open where there were two guys taking, you know, a, a B gap instead and leaving a C gap wide open. That that's something that you you just you can't make those mistakes, especially when you have a team like East Carolina who, uh, you know, has some of those speed, you know, those faster guys where you're not quite able to catch up to them if you're the free safety. I, I mean, I think. You know, when you look at Pittsburgh, we know what they're going to do, and they're going to run the football, and they're going to run it up the middle of that defense. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's going to be on those linebackers to really step up and make some plays. You know, Cole Holcomb, I think, is going to have to be ready, and I think he will be. But Jonathan Smith, I think, is the biggest guy that, to me, has to be ready to go in the middle of that defense. They are going to be running it straight at you. You've got to know your assignments in the middle of that that defense, know your gaps, and it's on the defensive tackles, like you said. You know, take away that middle of that def- of that defense. Make them run that ball to the outside because that's where you're going to be able to, you know, at least have these opportunities in open space to make tackles, especially against Olison, who is really not a, I mean, he's not a speed guy. He's a guy that, you know, kind of runs with success because of his physicality. If you're this de- these defensive tackles, and I think to this point in the season, you know, they really haven't done a bad job, um, but I think they could take it to a little bit of another level, and they're going to have to with, you know, some of the struggles of the linebacking core, as we've seen really for the last few years, and with that secondary to tackle, you know, it's going to be on uh, Jeremiah Clark, who I think to this point has played pretty well, and Jalen Dalton to squeeze that middle and make them bounce it to the outside. And then the defensive ends have to be able to take away those C and D gaps and force that all the way to the outside, allowing some of these slot corners and guys like J.K. Britt to get out there and make these tackles. And then, you know, you mentioned it, you know, forcing them into third downs. I think the biggest thing is on these long third down opportunities that you have as a defense, you need to be able to get off the field. And whether or not that's been because of, you know, the quarterback making a play, completing the ball down the field, which we saw a couple of times against ECU on third and long, or the poor discipline with a penalty like we saw with Tyler Powell's hit late hit on Reed Herring against ECU. You know, it's it's things like that where if you're handed those opportunities, you've got to find a way to get off the field. And you know, I, I don't know how you exactly do that. Discipline-wise, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, just be smart about what you're doing, If you know, especially on third down. If there's any chance that you think that you could be penalized for something, don't even bother doing it. Just, you know, hold up if you're going to hit the quarterback. 
if, if he gets rid of the football, it's fine. You know, whether if it's complete or not complete, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, but I, you know, I think execution wise, you know, I, I, these guys, they got to do a better job of recognizing where the sticks are. If you're the cornerbacks or safeties, I feel like that was a little bit of a problem against ECU. A lot of these guys were backing up a lot further into their zones than they probably should have been. And, you know, it's really going to be on that defensive line when, you know, you're only rushing four to be able to get in that backfield and, and rush those decisions. Don't let Kenny Pickett go through his first, second, third, possibly even fourth, uh, you know, progression to eventually find someone that's open or create those secondary routes that are going to lead to completions down the field. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different things I think that we need to do well. You know, with the offense, I think, you know, running the ball, I think is going to bring the most success. I'd like to see them kind of lean on a running game that has been stronger than the passing game to this point in the season. And the other thing is, is by running the football, especially if you're trying to make a conscious effort to run it on first and second down, you're going to have a chance to at least set yourself up in third and mediums or third and shorts. Because so far this year, it is very similar to last year. A lot of third and longs, and that is not going to lead to success. Now, part of that is because most of the time we are passing on either first or second down, or we're passing on both first and second down. Despite the struggles of the offense, and most of the time, as we've talked about on the podcast so far this season multiple times, it's pretty much deep pass after deep pass. So, you know, if you're going to throw the football, I understand it. At the same time, you know, it's either been deep pass or screenplay has been the only other thing that we've really seen. I want to see some of these intermediate routes, maybe some of these slant routes across the middle to Thomas Jackson, to Daz Newsome, to some of these slot guys that can potentially get you going. I want to see some of these intermediate 10 to 15 yard routes to sort of open up the middle of the field. That's that's kind of what you want from this offense, especially with Nathan Elliott behind center. And even with Cade Fortin, you don't want your quarterback having to go out there and throw bombs every single time he's out there, especially, as you mentioned earlier, with receivers that really haven't been able to separate quite on the level that you would hope they would have been to this point. You know, we're still looking for that deep threat ever since we lost Mac Hollins. And, you know, coming into the season, I thought maybe Diami Brown was going to be that guy. Uh, to this point right now, he just hasn't been able to create that type of separation. So it'll be interesting to see if maybe this is the game where he can open up against a secondary, as we mentioned in Pittsburgh, that has had their struggles under Narduzzi. But, you know, it, it, I, I think there's also a chance that a guy like Rontavius Toe Groves, who I think has played pretty well to this point in the season, has you know, maybe he has the opportunity to break out. Maybe this is his chance because right now, in my eyes, he's been the second best receiver on this team. So, you know, I, I think this team has a lot of things that they can you know work on in, in this game. And I think that there is a real chance that they can pull out this victory. But you know, it's like you said, you, you know, you've got to find a way to get pressure on the quarterback, get off the field on third downs and, you know, offensively find a way to move those sticks, create some momentum and put some points on the board. Because if you don't, there's a real chance that you can end up losing a game that is, in my eyes, winnable. So, um, you know, when you look at, I, I guess, let me see where I want to go with this. So far this season, I guess we'll take a little bit more of a positive turn here before we get ready to close the podcast. Um, you know, who are the guys that have really stood out to you and, and maybe surprised you to this point? Um, you know, that, that could be potentially those guys that break out as the season goes along. Well, I think that it starts with the offensive line. I mean, there have been issues in the offensive line, but those were somewhat to be expected. So, you, you know, we thought that we were going to get good things from guys like Will Sweet and Charlie Heck, um, and I think that we're going to get more of that. I think that what I've seen from William Barnes kind of rotating with Billy Ross at that right guard position, I like what I've seen from him. And I, I think there's been other true freshmen that have played that I've been very impressed with. One that sticks out to me is Trey Morrison kind of 
at yeah, that yeah. Nickelback spot. I mean, the Nickelback spot was uh, one that kind of fluctuated throughout, you know, the spring and fall camp. It was Miles Wolfhook last year. He kind of got banged up and kind of lost it there in the spring. It was Bryson Richardson. He got a little bit banged up, was kind of uh, unable to practice fully. And then it was Trey Morrison. And Trey Morrison has just come in and locked it down in terms of holding that position. And he's been ve- he's been very impressive so far. Um, but I, I think that really every unit on this team has the ability to improve and be a good unit. I think that there's a lot of physical talent. There's a lot of speed on this team. I, I really like what I've seen from the running backs, even if it's been in short spurts. I, I really don't have a running back that I haven't been impressed with that I've seen. Mm-hmm. I like Antonio Williams. I like Jordan Brown. Uh, I've appreciated Jordan Brown more this year than I think that Tar Heel fans did last year uh, when we were all comparing him to, to Michael Carter. And uh, I've actually really liked the true freshman, Javante Williams. I've liked what I've seen from him. Um, not only running the ball, he's run the ball, you know, kind of, I guess they would say above his pads, kind of with a forward lean, but he's also caught the ball pretty well. Uh, And then, of course, the very little that we saw at Cade Fort, I like. So I think something that Carolina fans should keep in mind of this team is that outside of really the defensive line, this is a pretty young team. This is a team full of freshmen and sophomores that still have many years ahead of them and many years to – become a good team so I, I don't think that there's really any reason to worry in terms of the overall picture of Carolina there there are going to be struggles here in the beginning those are things that we kind of assumed going into this season not, now not to the extent that we see here but there are still pieces in place on this team uh, both in terms of players and in terms of coaches to turn this around yeah I, I mean you're you're right and Yes, that's a very good point, especially when you bring up the youth. The secondary is extremely young, and I like what you said. You know, Trey Morrison has been a guy that has really looked pretty good so far. I think Bryson Richardson has even looked pretty good in the reps that we've seen him out there. You know, C.J. Cotman, you can say what you want, and I know a lot of people are going to say, well, he had two, two long passes caught over him at ECU, including one for a touchdown. There's really nothing he could do. I thought it was sensational coverage by him. They were just both times the wide receiver from East Carolina, Trayvon Brown, made a play. And that's really not something that you can control as a cornerback. What you want to see is that that cornerback is at least in position, especially if it's a man-on-man situation. If it's man coverage, you want to see that cornerback sticking with him. And I think that's exactly what C.J. Cotman did. So, yeah, I'm really encouraged by what I've seen from that group. Um, You know, I I think Rontavious Toe Groves is definitely a guy that I I think has a real chance to become a solid piece in this offense. I like the way he runs routes, and I think he does have the speed to potentially create separation if needed. I mean, we saw he had the one big catch against East Carolina, and there's been a couple other times where he's run pretty good routes and gotten the football down the field about 14 to 15 yards down the field, and and that's kind of what we need is a guy that can run some of those technically sound routes down the field to sort of open up this passing game, Hit some of those sideline routes. That that's kind of what we need in this offense. And yeah, it makes sense that he could potentially be that guy because we heard all of these things coming out of high school about him. It was just the injuries set him back. And you know, I agree with you. None of the running backs to this point have been disappointing to me. I think Jordan Brown, if anything, should have received the ball more in the second half against ECU. I don't understand why they cut back the number of carries for him. Uh, I, I guess maybe you could say because they got down as much as they did, but really they really weren't down that much until late in the third quarter, early in the fourth. And it seemed it, even early in the third quarter that they were trying to force a passing game that just really wasn't there. But yeah, no, Antonio Williams to this point, I think has looked pretty good. Um, you know, I thought once the offensive line settled in against Cal, that that was where he really started to take over. I think that first half, if you're taking a whole lot of uh, stock from that, then you 
I don't know what to tell you because, yeah, the offensive line was really what struggled then. And then once they got going, you could see the running game start to get their wheels churning. And, yeah, I, I, I'm wondering if they're going to give Cade Fortin the opportunity. And if they do, I, I'm with you. I think he has a real chance to sort of make a little bit of a name for himself and maybe, you know, have people – think twice about the notion that Chad Surratt is the guy that we have to go to immediately when he comes back. I mean, if Cade Fortin comes out and let's say finds a way to win against Pittsburgh, I, I don't see how you could then just turn to Chad Surratt. So maybe that's what ends up happening. I, I've seen some of these young guys, especially that have brought some encouraging things to the table. And it's like you said, I think this team does have a future. The concern, I think, for most people lies on the recruiting trail with the 2019 class, and justifiably so. When you only have 12 commits so far in the class, you're ranked second to last in the ACC, there is going to be some concern. But I think of the guys that are on the roster right now, I agree with you. There is a lot here that in future years, I think it's just going to be able to grow. And the fact that they are getting as much playing time as they are early in their careers, I think is really going to help them. These guys are going to be a lot more mature than some of the guys that we're seeing having to play extensive minutes as upperclassmen now when they are under upperclassmen. So, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see which one of these guys continues to take, you know, who continues to take steps forward. Um, I think there will be some guys for sure that I, I think will be household names by season's end that may not be uh, as we sit here today. But, you know, it's going to take time for some of those guys to, you know, sort of get that recognition, especially if this team stays where it's at right now. So, um, yeah, I think uh, with that, we'll turn, you know, back to the game officially and sort of give our predictions here. I know I saw your predictions. Uh, I think you put them out today for the, was it just the ACC this week, I think, that you had done, or was it major games? I know you picked our game. And you uh, you said UNC hopefully. So um, are you gonna are you gonna stick with that uh, as we sit here tonight? Yeah. So about uh, sort of towards game week, probably about Thursday, I'm planning on doing picks, really just of games that interest me that week. So okay. primarily major games, but really mm -hmm. just games that I find interesting, not only uh, within any specific conference, uh, just throughout all all the major Power Five conferences. Uh, but I am always gonna pick. UNC's game every week. Uh, okay. I'll probably give away my pick before the podcast every week. Um, but I am going with UNC this week. Hopefully, that's very tentative based on what we've seen so far out of this team. But I do think that this is a game that UNC can win. I think that mm -hmm. the coaching staff has really had a good handle on what Pitt wants to do. I think that Pitt doesn't throw a whole lot your way in terms of exotic looks or exotic play calls or things like that. I think they really know what they want to do. And it's really just if they're successful with it or not. I do think that they're going to have some success running the ball to some extent. They're probably going to break some big plays. But I do think that probably with a combination of um, Nathan Elliott and Cade Fortin and hopefully the running game that UNC could get it done, in terms of a score prediction, I'm going to predict uh, very tentatively – a close UNC win, probably a, a 24-21 sort of win, low-scoring game um, in Keenan Stadium, but hopefully one that will lead to you know a successful renewal of the season and uh, the first win in conference play. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you, and I think that you know when you look at the line right now, they have Pitt as a four-point favorite. I am going to take the Tar Heels to cover, and I am going to take them to win outright. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because Larry Fedora, you know, he's owned Pat Narduzzi since the two have began meeting in the ACC. And, you know, when I look at it, it's kind of like you said. Look, we know what Pittsburgh's going to throw at us. If we can stop the run, if we can put them in these third and long situations, make Kenny Pickett win the game. And, you know, I know he's done it before. He did it against Miami last year, but we really haven't seen that since that point. So far this season, he's struggling out of the gate, and that's with an offensive line that is experienced and to this point has really seemed to do a good job in front of him. So, if you are able to potentially get a little bit of pressure in there, that could throw him off even more. 
and potentially open up a chance for you to win this game. And and I think, you know, when I look at this offense, look, they've had two weeks to sort of regroup. I think that if they run the ball successfully, which I know they can do, they have the potential to open up the passing game. I want to see this team sort of go away from always trying to hit the deep passes that may not be there and sort of take what's there, whether that's the short, you know, screen game. Um, you know, I, I think that you need to look a little bit further down the field, whether that's the intermediate passing game in the middle of the field, the intermediate passing game on the outside, Whatever's there, you've got to take whatever the defense is dealing you. They're, they seem to be trying to force something that the defense is attempting to take away from them so far this season. And, you know, I think the other key, like I said, y- you've got to be disciplined. And that's something that has been such a big issue under Larry Fedora. I, I think they get that figured out this week at home against Pitt. I think the environment in Keenan Stadium will be pretty good. I don't know if it's going to be a sellout, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of people are excited for this week. It, you know, Especially as time has gone on, I think the emotions of the loss to ECU have sort of simmered. So I think ultimately, at home for the first time this year, a crucial game for them coming off the pseudo bye week. And, you know, I, I think just the motivation that they, they've they had from everybody saying, look, this is the same team as last year. I think they find a way to pull out a victory at home against Pittsburgh. So, yeah, I, I'm encouraged. I'm ready to go. And uh, I'll be uh, in front of the uh, TV. I'll be uh, watching that game. I'll get a hopefully a quick report in before I get on uh, on the air to cover hockey for um, hockey TV for the Charlotte Rush here in Charlotte. So, um, but I will be locked in. Luckily, they play at twelve twenty, so I will have a little bit of time. So, yeah, hopefully, I'll uh, I'll get that in and be ready to go. So, um, yeah, what's your plan, man? I'm assuming you're going to stay at your house and just uh, sit back and watch and hopefully uh, pray for the best. Pretty much. I mean, I have some stuff, uh, you know, to do that afternoon, but I'll, I'll definitely be watching that game, uh, trying to. See See if, the, if I see anything different. I'm hoping to, whether that be you know personnel change or really just play calling changes. But uh, I'm really just hoping for a good game. Really hoping to you know see the Carolina that we've been used to uh, seeing sort of uh, in 2015 and 2016. Probably not that level in terms of wins and losses, but just a renewed sort of uh, I guess standard of, of play. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right, and I think that's the main thing that a lot of people, um, you know, are kind of looking for is just, you know, kind of having those standards to live up to, you know, come out with, you know, some sort of energy, especially early in the game, that's been something that the last two years for sure, and really since that loss to Duke back in 2016, we just haven't really seen, there's been so many slow starts and you're just asking for a game where this team comes out, maybe jumps out on top, you know, 7 nothing even or 14 nothing. I mean, I'm trying to remember when was the last time that we actually played a game, I'll say this, against an FBS opponent, um, that, that we've actually had a lead out of the gate and, and really felt confident in ourselves to say, hey, man, you know, we've jumped out to this lead. We've got, a, you know, we're in control now let's see if we can't finish this game. Pretty much since the start of the 2017 season, I mean, Old Dominion might be the one other game that you can kind of say maybe they did that. But really since you know, every other game in between there has been, you know, well, we can't really get off to a hot start. Now we're playing from behind. How are we able to come back and find a way to win this game? So, yeah, I mean, if they can, if they can get off to a hot start, maybe they can get a little bit of confidence underneath them and find a way to get this victory at home, which could be crucial for us. At this point, the goal, like you said, go 9-0 and uh, with the schedule that's left ahead of us, but let's just start by getting on the board and let's start by getting a conference win. So, um, yeah, guys, that's going to do it for us here on uh, this Pittsburgh preview edition of the podcast. I want to thank Zach 
for stopping by as always uh, to talk a little bit of Tar Heel football. As you guys know, the game will start at 1220 this Saturday. You can watch the game on Raycom Sports, which will be your local CBS station. And if you can't watch the game on your television, you can, of course, listen to the game on the Tar Heel Sports Network. That will be 97.9 or 13.60 a.m. in Chapel Hill. Here in Charlotte, it will be 99.3 FM or 11.10 a.m. WBT. And then in Raleigh, it will be 106.1 WTTK. So, uh, yeah, guys, as always, subscribe to the podcast on Spreaker.com. Apple uh, has it as well as Google Play, Spotify, uh, TuneIn app. Guys, it, it's everywhere. This podcast is breaking out, and it's been great thanks to you guys. As always, check out the blog. Just go to Medium.com and search Heel Tough Blog. So want to thank you guys for listening, and as always, Go Tar Heels!